Liquid gold is how doctors are describing Diana Berendt's convalescent plasma. COVID-19 survivor Berendt is New York State's first donor of convalescent plasma in the race to find therapies against the virus. Diana was diagnosed on March 18th. She got better with lots of Tylenol and Gatorade. And as soon as she was strong enough, she began what is now one of the fastest growing grassroots movements in America called Survivor Co. She joins me now from an open Zoom window in Long Island. Diana, I'd like you to walk us through the worm's eye view of testing from the time you got diagnosed. What's the patient experience been like? Tell us. Um, thank you so much for having me on, first of all. I really appreciate it. Um, the testing here in America um, has not gone particularly well. Um, I can, can tell you about my experience, but I don't want to dwell too much. There are enough people out there who can speak to all the things that have gone wrong, and I'd rather focus on what we can do um, in sort of a more solution-based, forward-looking approach. But I can tell you a little bit about my own experience. I was exposed to the virus pretty early on in the cycle, and I figured out that I had been exposed to it at a meeting on the evening of March 9th, and um, it took me about a week to figure that out. It was a business-type meeting, not social, under the recommendation of 10. There was no food involved. There were people that I had only met a couple of times before, and um, so it just shows you how contagious it is. And um, I woke up on March 13th, Friday the 13th, with 102 fever, and I felt like I had, you know, this tremendous weight on my chest. I had a respiratory infection that I woke up with out of the blue. I hadn't had a fever in over a decade, and um, I had been very, very careful leading up to this. I'd been watching the news quite carefully coming out of China and of Italy, and I was very nervous about what was coming our way. So the second that I woke up with those symptoms, even though um, there had been a couple of people in my area, and when I say area, I mean an area that's the size of Manhattan, you know, um, not a small town by any stretch of the imagination. Um, only a couple of people had been diagnosed at that point and nobody had come forward with their identities. So I went to go get tested and I was told that unless I had traveled to China, Italy, or Iran in the last couple of months, I had to prove that I had had 10 minutes of sustained close exposure to somebody who had tested positive, which I realized was a complete catch-22 because if nobody is being tested, how could you possibly prove that? Um, and that sort of started me down this rabbit hole of being kind of what I call the canary in the COVID coal mine and seeing where their, the system was broken down and where we could rebuild it as um, just an order, as a grassroots movement. And so far we have, it's been, it's been incredible. But the, te the, the road to my initial testing was quite difficult. And it was only after I posted on Facebook about the situation and the message went, pardon the expression, went viral. Um, and it ended up reaching my congressman who had to intervene to get me tested, which was you know, very good for me, but not a scalable solution. You have to remember that this was over a month ago when schools were still open and businesses were still open. So I felt that I had a real moral and civic duty to report to my kids' school districts and other anywhere else there I, where I had frequented in the previous 10 days because at that point I didn't know where I'd been infected and I didn't know how long I'd been contagious for. I've been scrolling through the posts on Survivor Co. It's pretty intense. From the time that you talk about till now, are people saying that things are better with the testing? Um, there is more available testing right now than there was before, but there's also a ma much higher rate of infection than there was before. So while the tests might be more readily available than they were a month ago, most people who come down with any symptom, and you have to keep in mind that COVID presents itself as a constellation of symptoms. And so each person has a different subset. And if you have any one or two of those, your best bet is to really just assume that you are already infected. Um, I say this all the time, act as if you're already infected and every single person you infect is either your best friend or your grandmother. 
Um, the reason why I say that is because with the difficulty in getting tested, the chances, if you're running around town trying to chase down that test, it's more likely that you're going to be shedding that virus everywhere you go. And um, if you didn't have it beforehand, after sitting in an urgent care office for four hours waiting for one, I can guarantee that you'll walk out with it. So it, it is, it, that's something that could definitely be improved upon um, when other countries are looking at best practices. Our, uh, our initial testing would not be a model for sure. You know, given how intense the symptoms are and the ones you talk about, do you feel comfortable with the social distancing guidelines that currently exist? No, not at all. Um, they were six, six feet. Uh, we're, now, we're now hearing that it can be 13 feet. We're now understanding that it can be tracked on your shoes. Um, we really don't know a lot about this virus. And that's one of the reasons why I launched Survivor Corps is to basically mobilize an army of survivor volunteers to donate their plasma and to participate in every single study available because the answers to so many of those questions lie in the bodies of survivors and we can support those scientific efforts to figure out the answer. My recommendation is not social distancing. My recommendation is this, it's very simple. No one in, no one out, no exceptions. Now, I understand that it is a privilege to be able to remain home and a lot of people, the essential workers don't have that option. And some people live in homes that are so crowded or unsanitary or unsafe that it causes a real problem. So I understand the difficulties that come along with that recommendation, but don't go to the grocery store. You know, eat that last can of tuna fish that's been sitting in your pantry for years and years. Now is the time to get to the bottom of your freezer. Whatever you can do, stay at home. I don't think you can be too careful with this. But last heard, governments are planning to open up. So how do you as a survivor react to policy changes? And I'm sure it's a more intimate experience now. You've been there. Um, I think it is a disaster. <laughs> um, the idea of opening up before we have anything controlled. I mean, on a more immediate level, one of the things that we've seen out of Survivor Corps, which is one of the unintended benefits of Survivor Corps, and that's one of the reasons why I, lo I love talking to global media, because this is truly a best practice that, that can be adopted globally. Um, we have collected one of the best sort of data sets on survivors that exist, which is really incredible. And a good example of that is we were seeing story after story after story, all telling the same thing. People were going to go donate their plasma 14 days post-symptomatic. Those are the rules in order to qualify for any study or any plasma donation program, convalescent plasma program. And almost all of them were proving to still have the virus in their system. In order to be a plasma donor, you have to test negative, a follow-up negative test for the virus, the diagnostic test, and test positive for the antibodies. And not just positive in a black and white way, um, but to know that the concentration level of your antibodies is high enough, that your titer level is high enough. Um, and so when we started to look at that data, because in America, the only people who are getting tested on the back end of the virus are those going to give plasma. And the convalescent plasma programs weren't advertising this, but if you look at the numbers and you see how many applicants they have and how many people have been screened and then ask them how many actual units of plasma they've collected, a lot of that has been because most people are showing up at 14 days still with the virus in their system. Now they could st still be contagious. They might not be, it's unclear, but they are being sent back into quarantine. Now at the same time, our CDC, which, which is their recommendation, and it's being um, mimicked by other states like New York, which is the epicenter where I live, is that you can release, you should really be able to release yourself out of quarantine and go back into society at a socially distant basis um, at 72 hours post-symptomatic. And we now know that that is not based on any science. It is an effort to get frontline workers back on the job, um, but it 
it followed and there's no reason why it won't be. People are trying to follow the rules, but the rules that have been set up, the guidance that it's have been set up is woefully inadequate and could potentially lead to a massive wave of reinfection. It, it, it sort of blows the mind to, to think that we could have an entire country on virtual lockdown and shut down our entire national economy and send people back out into the world after 72 hours when all you need to do is wait a couple of weeks um, and you'll be safe. So I, even though a lot of these studies recommend 14 days post-symptomatic, I tell people that really 21 to 28 days is where you're going to really find yourself in the safe zone. And in order to donate plasma, also your will be that much higher. But um, yeah, we, we socially distancing is, um, I think, a little bit like wearing a mask and gloves. It gives people a false sense of security and allows them to engage in behavior that is really detrimental to the public good. And, you know, all you need is one person to infect another, to infect a hundred more. I really want you to walk us through the process of convalescent plasma donation. Tell us what led you to Columbia University and how that went. I would love to talk to you about this. I, when you, as soon as you mentioned it, I had a ear to ear grin on my face. So I ended up being participant number 0001 at Columbia University's convalescent plasma program. And so what, I'm just gonna walk you through the process from there till donation, because I wanna sort of take the mystery out of it. And um, a lot of people have get, been getting a lot of questions, you know, what's the recovery like, which by the way, there's none. Um, it was not only so incredibly easy, but it was one of the most gratifying experiences of my entire life. So it started with going through Columbia and I had had a positive previous diagnosis, um, although those, those standards are changing on a daily basis. So I don't want to go too much into the criteria because, you know, they've changed from yesterday and will be different by tomorrow. But I had had a previous positive diagnosis. I went into Columbia, they did a follow-up nasal swab, a diagnostic test to make sure that I no longer had the virus in my system. They took a couple of vials of blood to make sure that I had the antibodies and that the concentration of the antibodies, the titer level was high enough for me to be an, a, a viable plasma donor. The icing on the cake turned out to be that I am AB uh, blood type, which for plasma is the universal donor. That's only four to five percent of the population. So as my doctor referred to it, my plasma is liquid gold because it can truly be matched with those who have the rarer blood types who are finding it harder to get matched. So once I got the, the, all of that good news, um, as a week ago, Monday, the first thing I did was I called the New York Blood Center, uh, which Survivor Corps is now an official partner with, as well as the Asso American Association of Blood Banks. I made an appointment for, I got the first appointment I could get. And I went in, and I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit about the process, because it was it was amazing. I mean, I, I can't even talk about it without... Um, there's just a feeling of such satisfaction and joy that as, I mean, in a lifetime, how many times can you save a single life? Um, but in 32 minutes, have the op uh, uh, opportunity to save three to four lives and be able to do that every seven days. So I went to the New York Blood Center and they took my temperature, they took my blood pressure, they did a finger uh, tip uh, prick to make sure that I wasn't anemic. Um, you know, you have to qualify for all the same rules that apply to donating blood, although the FDA here in America has recently relaxed a lot of those regulations, which I'm happy about, although there's more that, that, that can be done on that front. Once, once I cleared all of those hurdles, um, which took about five minutes, um, I was brought back into the donation area, and it's just like giving blood, except for even better, because what happens is they they put the IV in and they take out the blood and there's this machine sitting next to you which looks like it's out of science fiction and it separates the plasma from the rest of the blood from the red and white blood cells and it keeps the plasma and puts the blood right back into your system 
and you lie there. It tells you when you're supposed to squeeze the ball, which is, you know, every few minutes, you give it a few squeezes. And it was 32 minutes from beginning to end. Um, I drove myself there and home in, and that's a 45 minute drive, not insignificant. I didn't feel a thing. I don't have a bruise on my arm, no soreness, um, no nothing. It was, they handed me cookies and juice on the way out. Uh, there was a room where you could sit and relax and enjoy it. I went straight to my car and ate it on the way home. So there was absolutely no recovery. And I truly, I, I really, I really felt like a superhero. I mean, it was the most gratifying experience. And I went again yesterday for my second donation and I have a standing appointment every seven, day, every seven days. What do you think helped you beat COVID? I'm, I'm very fit. I, I'm athletic. I am adventurous. Um, I was just, you know, saying before, I, I photographed the Kumela last year, chest high in the Ganges River for well over an hour. I didn't even need a Pepto-Bismol after that. I was totally fine. Um, everyone thought that I was crazy and I really shrugged them off. And um, I had, I have a pretty strong immune system and I was one of the first people to go down. So it shows you that everybody is vulnerable to this because at that time we were really only thinking that it was the elderly and the immunocompromised, of which I'm obviously neither. <laughs> um, so it was quite a shock. That said, um, I'm one of the lucky ones, but I'm in the vast, vast majority. Most people will have recoveries like mine. And so if you're home and you're scared, um, this is the face of a survivor. I feel 100% back to myself, but almost better because I now have this internally built hazmat suit in my body that I can now share with others. Um, in terms of sort of the mental toll of it, there, it was quite scary. I, I don't want to take away from that because one of the bizarre things about this virus, and there are many, but one is it has this sort of biphasic nature where you think after you know seven or eight days, you're feeling better. And at that point, you can really take a dip for the worse. And beyond that, as we spoke about, the symptoms vary so wildly from person to person that, and it has a, um, I, would, I would say that it does not have a straight line road to recovery. The trajectory is much more one step forward, one step back. And so if you, I didn't know anyone who had it when I had it. And now the, you know, the advice that I give people in terms terms of pacing themselves through their recovery is to expect it to take a few weeks. Um, I've heard people who it's taking them a month, four, five, six weeks to, to kick it. Um, it's not like the flu where you're really sick for a few days and then you feel better the next day and a little bit better the day after that and the day after that. This is, um, this is a much stranger path. And if you know that going into it, it's... Um, really a I think a real mental relief and knowing that at the end of the day I think one of the things that I love seeing on, in our Facebook group and again it's an open group on Facebook open to everybody called Survivor Core and we are launching our website um, I'll give you the sneak preview it's www.survivorcore.com c-o-r-p-s like the Peace Corps and um, you know I'm seeing post after post of people counting down the days until they can donate, until they can give back. Because it's very hard to be told, I mean, what we are being told as a global community really is the best thing you can do right now is do nothing. And that is antithetical to the human spirit. Um, there's something internal to all of us that we want to help. And that lack of agency and lack of ability to affect change is so frustrating. And um, I, I think, you know, you have to ride out the physical symptoms. Obviously, if you have any trouble breathing, you need medical attention immediately. But most people will be able to resolve it at home, just like I did. And having a goal at the end, knowing of what these superpowers that you are going to have inside your body, and that you will be able to personally contribute to finding an end to this virus is an extraordinarily motivating factor.